Northern Ireland has now actually become a, a form of colony, the EU's first kind of colony. If Stormont goes back, they, in fact, would be almost like what happened in fr in, during the war with the Fichy government. All those MLAs would, would be collaborators with a kind of colonial government. I welcome the uh, tabling of the fatal motion today. At least, at the very least, it's given your Lordship's House an opportunity to actually discuss something that's been pretty well rushed through uh, by His Majesty's Government. Uh, I see that it's actually called the Windsor Framework Bracket Democratic Scrutiny. And of course, we're not really having much scrutiny. We've got this SI on one particular aspect, although, of course, Downing Street itself said that this was the way that we could discuss the framework, the Windsor Framework. And uh, I, I think that it's important that uh, if I was going back to my days way back when I taught, I, I would almost want to start by saying how many people have actually read the detail of, of the Windsor Framework and then how many people have actually read the EU legal text interpretation of it, because the two things are very, very different. And I have to say right at the beginning that I think the problem with His Majesty's Government on this issue has been that they started off by overselling hugely what was in the framework. The Prime Minister went to Northern Ireland, spoke at the Coca-Cola factory, made it out as if everything, everything had been solved. It was just wonderful. He was almost jumping up and down with delight, as, as has uh, um, the Secretary of State. And I'm very pleased to see the Secretary of State here listening to us today. Uh, but of course, all the things that were said in that first 24 hours, the sort of blandness like removes the Irish sea border, restores the free flow of trade, protects Northern Ireland's place in our union. That was a, a, a tweet from the Secretary of State. You know, Northern Ireland people are not stupid. And Northern Ireland people then actually went on to read the framework document and to read what the EU said. And as I said, it's very, very different indeed. Now, uh, uh, Lord Moran, in his, Noble Lord Moran, in his opening uh, speech, did talk about the new uh, issues that were, came about just yesterday from a spokesman in the, in the European Parliament. And I'll mention that in a moment. But I just want to deal initially, because this should be a wider debate, because that's what the Prime Minister said we were having when we discussed the framework. Uh, th th this particular SI, and one of the, um, I just want to say on the actual break, I actually genuinely think it's a bit of a sham. It's very similar to what is uh, what takes place in Norway, who are not in the EU but are in, in in aspects of it, and it has only been actually uh, invoked once that they tried to stop something happening. It was something called the Post Office Workers' Directive, which I remember being very involved with actually helping to support some of the people in Norway on, on that issue. And they campaigned and they worked extremely hard. And in the end, the EU put on so many uh, penalties that they were going to impose if it wasn't put through. So I don't think anyone should think that this is a proper break. But even if it was working, even if it was brilliant, even if everyone was saying there's no problem with it, I don't accept that we should have to have it in Northern Ireland, because Northern Ireland has the same ballot paper. We voted to leave the European Union as a United Kingdom. We joined into uh, the, the, the original common market as one United Kingdom. So why are we even having to discuss this? And you know, it was interesting how many of your noble lordships talk about compromise. We've got to compromise. And I think one of the, uh, 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 one noble lord said about you know, the border. We couldn't possibly have a border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. It would be absolutely, all the, be absolutely dreadful, absolutely terrible, because you know what might happen if there was a, some kind of border. And let's think why we say that. We say that because the Republican movement, the IRA, <coughs> bombed all over Northern Ireland, bombed on the mainland. The Northern Ireland pro-union people didn't bomb on the mainland, didn't bomb in Northern Ireland. Of course, there were paramilitary terrorists uh, on, on all sides. But the reality is, 
we won't think about even talking about some kind of, of, of we don't need structures anyway because even the EU have said that it can be <coughs> invisible. But we do immediately put it into our own country, an Irish sea border, because there isn't the threat there. And I think all noble lords should actually examine their consciences on this in terms of what we're prepared to do. We're letting violence and threats of violence actually attack our sovereignty. So don't let's talk about this, uh, this particular storm at break as being anything other than a bit of sort of wonderful kind of uh, counterage that, counter that, that, that's put across it and there's hope that it would actually get, get agreement, as of course it will get agreement. I just want to refer again to what Bernard van Gotham, who's one of the senior veterinary uh, officers in the European Commission, said yesterday. And you sometimes think maybe that's why the government wanted to rush this all through, because now so much is coming out about what it's actually saying and what it's actually doing. And he said, the EU has now said that new light-touch arrangements for the movement of retail food consignments from GB to Northern Ireland will not be fully implemented until SPS inspection facilities at Northern Ireland ports have been completed and audited. And he told the European Parliament that officials from the EU veterinary office in Grange, County Meath, will carry out an audit of the facilities before the new system under the Windsor framework becomes fully operational. And he, he then went on to say that the process to change EU law through so-called implementing acts to facilitate the arrangements was conditional, was conditional on the completion of agri-food inspection at four Northern Ireland ports. None of the implementing acts will be adopted, he said, unless we are sure controls are done in a proper way, he told members of the European Parliament's Agriculture Committee. The controls, he said, currently in Northern Ireland are not up to the standard required by EU legislation. We have the assurance from the UK Government that the current facilities will be upgraded by October 2023 and that the final definitive SPS <coughs> inspection <coughs> facilities will be built by July 2025. And then finally, EU officials will be present to oversee the operation of future of the border <coughs> control posts where agri-food controls under EU rules will be carried out. What sovereign country actually allows a foreign ent entity to be responsible for looking at, border, at the borders and at checks and customs in their own country? And then if I could just refer, because it's a big issue, and it's again another one that I'm afraid the Secretary of State uh, and, and other government officials went on about, Pets. It's wonderful. You can take your pet from Great Britain now to Northern Ireland. All of you who are going this summer to Northern Ireland and are taking your pet, it was implied that you would not have to do anything. It would be like taking it from London to Glasgow. Well, of course, what we've now seen from the European Union on pets, pets, cats and dogs can be taken, isn't that nice of them, from GB to Northern Ireland if they are microchipped and accompanied by a pet travel document issued by the UK authorities. And the owner will also be required to produce a document that the pets will not move beyond Northern Ireland into the <coughs> south. And the noble lord talked about all those different 320 crossing bits. It could be very difficult to stop that pet moving. So that is one thing that, again, the government completely oversold it. And again, people in Northern Ireland are not stupid. On labelling, from October this year, all pre-packed meat and some pre-packed milk products will require not for EU <coughs> labels. And from October 2024, all milk and dairy products will require labels, while by July 2025, all retail goods should be labelled individually. <coughs> Look at the cost, the extra costs that for, for, for GB businesses. No wonder they don't want to be then dealing with Northern Ireland. And of course, Northern Ireland will then have to look to the Republic of Ireland to get more of their goods, at more, more expensive goods as well. <coughs> exactly what the Irish government want, an economic united Ireland. So don't fool yourselves, any of your lordships, that this is all just about you know, economic trade business. Underlying this, there is a deeply, deeply credible move by the Irish government, backed up by the EU, not just to not just to punish the United Kingdom for daring to leave the EU, but to leave Northern Ireland 
out on a limb and getting more and more out on a limb as more and more of these regulations come in. Uh, so we just saw what some of the holliers, the people who actually go uh, in and out, said themselves. And Paul Jackson, a very experienced hollier, said that this, the, this was an irreversible fracture to trade between Great Britain and, no and Northern Ireland. So, you know, when we go back to what was said at the beginning about all these things that was, that was, that was now making sure that free trade and movement and all of that, it is just not true. And one, another, other examples, and I'm sorry if, if noble lords feel I'm going on a bit, but I actually do think that some of them, some of you, yes, I'm sure, particularly on my left here, um, but I, 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 I would say that individuals, again, the whole question of seeds and garden plants, you know, can't get soil from Great Britain to come into Northern Ireland. And of course, that was all meant to be changed. It hasn't been changed. Individuals cannot get, if they, if they want to buy seeds, as they would normally do, buy seeds from a, a grower in, in Great Britain, they are told, and it's on all the websites of all the, practically all the big um, seeds distributors and plants, that they, will, they cannot sell to anywhere outside the United Kingdom's bracket, including Northern Ireland, without the consumer spending up to two, £250 minimum to get a certificate, first of all. So individuals who, who grow just seeds in their garden, want to get their own plants, don't want to go to a garden centre, do like they've always done, can no longer do that, with, do that without actually starting to pay £250. And how dare government ministers say that it's all been sorted. We know it hasn't been sorted and they don't want to admit it. And I'm not, noble lords, will be pleased to know, not going to mention duty-free here today. That's another issue and I find other ways of bringing up the duty-free issue and the fact that Northern Ireland has been left in a limbo. So finally, uh, I would say that there are people in Northern Ireland, leading politicians, who say, and it's true, that Northern Ireland has now actually become a, a form of colony, the EU's first kind of colony. And if Stormont goes back with this present Windsor framework, they, in fact, would be almost like what happened in, in, during the war with the Fichy government, where all those MLAs would, would be collaborators with a kind of colonial government taking foreign laws from a foreign legislature governing much of our economy in Northern Ireland and keeping us in a foreign customs code, whereas, whereby GB, Great Britain, our country, where our capital is, becomes a third country, becomes our foreign country. It's just not acceptable. Article 164 did ch says in the withdrawal agreement that everything, that everything, we could change everything about the protocol except the essential elements. And that is precisely what's happened. Nothing fundamental has changed. And I think the one thing that we probably all could agree in your Lordship's House on this is that the European Union got exactly what it wanted from the negotiations. It held out for a long time. Remember, we were all told, no, we can never open it up. We can never discuss it again. Held out for a long time. No, no renegotiation. Then it recognised the need to look like it was reacting to some of the real problems that even, even the most fanatical supporters of the EU saw were causing difficulties. And then it secured this on a very favourable terms, retaining a huge say over what happens in a part of a sovereign nation that, having left, is not meant to be subject to its own rules. So I would say to your Lordship's House, I know that you know, there's, we talked about elections coming in Northern Ireland, but there's obviously elections coming here, and I know that there's a, a great feeling of wanting everybody to be united. But I just would f end by quoting from one very senior Conservative in the other place who didn't vote for it. And he sent me a text to say why he wasn't voting for it. He didn't vote against it, because he's loyal to his party, but he said, I will not be voting for this framework. I decided that this was one vote where I don't want judgment of history against me. That's what I hope your noble lordships are thinking.